two. There we go. <laughs> When you're up on the mountain And you've got peace of mind Like you've never known But when things change And you're down in the valley Don't lose faith God and amen. He is God not only in the good times when it's bright and sunny out, but thank God he's God when it's not so good. Amen. If you have your Bibles this afternoon, I just have, I know every time I say this, I just know people are looking, uh huh, yeah, okay. I believe today I just have a very simple, short, reasonably short word of exhortation. I don't expect it to take more than maybe 20 or so minutes. And for those of you that are looking at your watches to time me and see, yeah, let's see if the preacher can do this or not. I don't expect it to take very long, but sometimes the Spirit of the Lord opens things up, you know, in your understanding as you're preaching and you, you kind of go places you weren't expecting to go. But if I only go where I'm expecting to go, this won't be real long. If you'll open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter uh, 5. Luke chapter number 5. And we're going to go all the way down to verse number 16 to begin with. We'll read 
right through verse 26. Luke chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. If you would stand with me today in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text reads, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch in the midst, into the midst before Jesus. And when he, meaning Jesus, saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered, he, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. And he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in this place. We thank you, Lord, every single opportunity we have to come into the house of God, for we count it today a privilege and an honor to come into your presence. We do not take the power of God today for granted. We do not take the presence of of the Lord for granted. But Lord, we understand that those who preceded us in the history of your great church have gone through great trials and great tribulations. And there have been many times in the history of the Christian faith when the people of God were not able to freely move about and they were not able to freely congregate and freely come together. And Lord, we live in an age and in a time where we have not only uh, the right, but we have the ability to come together as people of God, bringing our faith into the room that we might combine our faith and combine our hope and combine our trust in you in order to see great and wonderful things accomplished in your name. Master, we've come into this place today with great faith, believing that before we leave, we're going to hear from heaven. Before we leave, the Spirit of the Lord is going to speak to our hearts. Lord, we believe you're going to encourage us. We believe you're going to inspire us. We believe you're going to lift us up to heavenly places Places that we never before have occupied. Let our faith today be encouraged. Let it be multiplied. Help us this hour, O oh God, by your word to see our faith strengthened. Allow it to endure the tough times. Allow it to see us through the good times. Master, this day the word of God promises faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let every word that comes from this preacher's mouth be the word of God. Let it be anointed of the Holy Ghost. Let your spirit rest upon every syllable and every sound that those who might hear will know that they do not merely hear the opinions or thoughts of a man, but they're hearing a word from the Lord. Grant it this hour, we pray, for we ask 
asking in none other than Jesus' glorious, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Amen. Any one of us who have spent any time in the church growing up as a kid, or if we made a, a, a decision to serve the Lord later in life, most of us at some point in our lives have heard the story of the man who was carried by his friends to that place where the Lord was. And because there were so many people pressing in, you see, it's a wonderful thing when you understand that God is able to do what you need Him to do. Hallelujah. The Bible said on this particular day, Jesus had spent time away in the wilderness praying. And when He came back to uh, the population, when He came back to where the people were, listen, the Word of God said, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Everything Jesus Christ did. He did for us as an example. Honey. If you want to know where he got his batteries charged. If you want to know the source of his power. If you want to know the source of his strength. If you want to know the source of his endurance. It was in the prayer closet. It was in those times when he separated himself and he found time alone with uh, the Spirit of the Lord to commune and to fellowship with the Father. And today, for those of us that claim to be Christians, if we're going to have the kind of power in our life that Jesus demonstrated, if we're going to have God working through us and in us and with us the way he did the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to find that place of prayer. Hello now. Amen. You see, the disciples knew. They had watched the Lord's ministry enough to know what was the battery pack that kept His ministry charged. And they came to the Lord and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. <laughs> Amen. You see, Josh, they could have said, teach us to perform miracles. Teach us to cast out demons. Teach us to uh, do this or to multiply the bread and the fishes. Teach us to turn water into wine. But they didn't ask Him for those things. Why? Because they knew that if they could get prayer down, the rest would come. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? One of the problems I have with so many in the church world today and particularly in the affirming movement today is that we don't understand the absolute necessity of prayer. Why does this preacher, last night some of us went out and took a little fellowship trip out to First Monday Trade Days in Canton, Texas here. And I've been looking for months and months and months and months for some sort of a bench or some sort of a, just a, a backless bench, you know, that we could put at the front of our sanctuary in Garland to use as prayer altars. And I've been looking for months and months and I've told Tommy for years I've been telling Tommy, I still believe that every church that calls itself a Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal apostolic church needs altars. Boy, I'll tell you, that's old fashioned. You go to most churches today and just they don't have altars anymore. When they have a, uh, a, an, an, a quote altar service or when you call people down to the front to pray and all that, they'll just come down to the platform and they'll make an altar around the platform. I have a problem with that. Amen, I do. You know, how can I look at someone who prays in front of a statue of Mary and consider that idolatry, listen carefully to what I'm about to say, but I don't have a problem with people coming down and kneeling at the platform I preach from. Hello now. See, that bothers me. I don't like that. I never have liked it. 
I like an altar. You know why? Because all an altar is is a bench. Has no back. Has no arms on the side. People can go to the altar. You can kneel at the altar. You can get around the altar and you can pray. And if I'm going through a hard time and a struggle and I need somebody to pray with me, folks can get across from me and help me pray. People can get beside me and help me pray. But that particular piece of furniture is dedicated to being used as a place where God's people get in touch with the Lord. Hello now. Amen. I still believe in altars in the church. So we have a small storefront sanctuary in Garland, and obviously we couldn't use real great big altars, you know, or anything like that. And I've been looking for months and months and months, and finally, last night at First Monday, they had these two benches that are wide, they're about two feet wide or so, maybe even a little bit wider, 28 or 30 inches, I'm not sure exactly, and five feet or so long, six feet, whatever they are. And I looked at those, and you guys that were with me know, I said, oh man, those would make some good altars. That would be perfect for our altars. So we bought them. Hallelujah. God give us a great bargain on them. The price the lady was asking, I feel like, was a good price to begin with. But you know me, I'm a bargain hunter. So I offered her a little less and she took it. So we got them for a good price. But now we have a place in our sanctuary in Garland where those pieces of furniture are dedicated only to prayer. Amen. And what an altar represents in the church is we believe in prayer. Hallelujah. What an altar means inside a Pentecostal one God Jesus name apostolic church is that we believe the source of our power and the source of our strength is prayer. Hallelujah to God. That's what an altar says. When I go into a church and I see an altar, I know that those people know where the source of their power is, where the source of their strength is, where the source of their endurance is. It's in communication with God. Hallelujah. So I love altars. When we began to meet in this building and, and the church here agreed to share their space with us. The first thing I noticed was that they had these beautiful old wood benches sitting out in the other room. And I said, oh, hallelujah, we've got altars. Amen. Because the passage that I'm preaching from today starts out, you'll notice that it starts out with Jesus found a place away from everybody else to pray. And then immediately after that, what do we see? We see the power of God moving. We see people being healed. We see great things happening. Say, preacher, we hadn't seen some of these things in our church in a little while. Then, honey, when you get in the church house, get down on your knees and pray. Amen. Because there's a problem. A lot of churches think that you work the power of God up, but you don't work the power of God up. You pray it down. Amen. And if we'll get in the habit of getting in the altar and finding a, a place before the Lord, before the service begins, I promise you, you will see in very, very, very short order how quickly the tenor of the service will change. You'll see very quickly that things begin to change and things begin to happen. Say, well, but when I get down, what do I pray for? I'll tell you some things that I'd like our church folks to pray for. Number one, I'd like you to pray for the pastor because God knows he needs it. Amen. Secondly, I'd like you to ask the Lord, Lord, don't ask him, beg him, because we need this. God, make us a soul win in church. Amen. God, help us to reach people. Lord, there are people out there. You know, when you pray, people say, well, what do you say when you pray? It's easy. If you can't think of anything else, say the same thing a hundred different ways. Amen. Do you hear me now? When you talk to somebody, 
When someone's sitting next to you and you're talking to them and you say something and they don't quite understand what you say, what do you do? You say it again, but a different way. Amen? You kind of reword what you say because you figure, well, if they didn't understand the way I said it this way, I'll just kind of reword it and say it this way. Well, when you pray, you can do the same thing. Lord, make us a soul winning church. That's way number one. Lord, help us to reach the lost. That's way number two. Jesus, there are people out there that need you, that don't know you. Help us to find them and bring them in. There's way number three. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. Because I promise you, somewhere in there, the Lord's going to understand what you're trying to say. But pray, God, make us a soul winning church. Help us to reach folks that desperately need you. You see, there's no shortage today of people who need Jesus. Amen. There's no shortage. There's a shortage of people who recognize that they need Jesus. But there's no shortage of people who need Jesus. I was thinking just yesterday, I was thinking about the the term, you know, there's an old phrase people oftentimes will say, I found the Lord in 1960, or I found the Lord in 1954, or I found the Lord in 1922. Honey, you didn't find anything. The truth of the matter is today, He was never lost. You were. Hallelujah. You didn't find the Lord. He found you. Glory to God. The Lord found me in 1922. The Lord found me in 1950. The Lord found me in 1960. Because it's not about what you found, but it's about Him looking and caring and loving so that He could find you where you're at. There's no shortage today of people who need Jesus. But the problem is, there is a shortage today in today's world of people who recognize they need Jesus. That's the truth. But I'm going to tell you something else. And this is what I want this story, this passage that I've read this afternoon. This is what I want you to understand from this. There are many in our community, especially today, especially in the GLBT world and in our communities, there are many who are not necessarily in a place where they do not understand they need Jesus. But listen real carefully to what I'm about to say. But they're not in a position... To be able to get up and go to Jesus. Are you hearing me now? You see, there are some people today so hurt and so bruised and so beaten and so battered and so abused that even if they wanted to, Josh, they can't do it. And I'm going to tell you what they're looking for. I'm going to tell you what they need. I'm going to tell you what they're hoping for. They're hoping for someone like you and I that is going to care for them enough to pick them up and carry them. Hello now. Amen. They're looking for somebody. See, we can invite people to church all day and all night and nobody will show up. But it's a whole different ball of wax sometimes if you say, listen, be ready at 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon because I'm coming to get you. We're going to church. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, they know they need God. They know they need something from the Lord. But they just can't quite muster the energy. They can't quite muster uh, the enthusiasm. They can't quite muster the strength. To find that place where Jesus is on their own. Are you understand what I'm saying? And we need to be in a place today where we understand this. Honey, if I've got to carry you there, I'm going to get you there. Hallelujah. If I've got to drive you there, I'll get you there. If I've got to carry you there, I'll get you there. But one way or the other, you're going to get up and walk before too long. Hallelujah. And some people come back to God and they come back into the church and they say, Well, but brother, I'm still in a place where I'm trying to get better myself and 
I, I don't know if I'm ready to help anybody else. Well, let me tell you something. The fact that you're in this building today means you can walk. Hello now. The fact that you're in this building today means that you're in a far better place than that individual who's lying on that bed. Hello now. Amen. And that means that, my friend, you're in a position you can help somebody. And I'm going to tell you, there is nothing in this universe that will make you feel better about yourself and help you find a place of restoration quicker than helping somebody else find their way. Amen. I got some money this week that I wasn't expecting, and one of the first thoughts that went through my mind, and this this goes above and beyond paying my tithes and buying the church some things and trying to help the church get situated. But one of the first thoughts went through my mind. My brother has really been going through some tough circumstances in recent months he's been going through some really really tough times and one of the first thoughts went through my mind was well bless God I can help him amen I can help him I'm in a position see a month ago or two weeks ago I wasn't in a position to help him but now I am because there's nothing feels so good as being a blessing. See, some people love to bask in blessing when they're the ones being blessed. Amen. I know people who just love to get up and testify about how God gave me a free meal today and bless God, the Lord, something happened today and somebody bought my dinner and I wasn't expecting it and oh, what a blessing and oh, that just, I'm just so thrilled about it. But you want to know the funny part of it is that same person, God help me, doesn't testify very often. Well, you know what? I saw this person today and the Spirit of the Lord just touched my heart that they're going through a hard time and they're having a difficult circumstance. And the Lord just laid on my heart to buy them their meal. So I went ahead and paid for their meal. And boy, I got to tell you, I felt so good. See, some folks, Josh, they really enjoy blessing as long as they're the one being blessed. But I'm going to tell you right now, there is no greater blessing than when God puts you in a position to do the blessing rather than to receive the blessing. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And I told Tommy when I found this money in my account that I didn't even know I had. Had no idea it was there. Had no idea. It was purely an accident, so to speak, that I even found it. And the first words off my lips were, I can bless Michael. Amen. I can be a blessing to my brother. I can help him because he has no other, you know, he has no other help. He has nobody else that can do this. And I thought, I can be a blessing. But you know, so many people, when the resources come to them, all they can think about is what I can do for me. But I told Tommy, I said, you know, there's no greater investment. You want to make your money multiply? You want to make your resources begin to multiply? You can invest in the stock market, which these days is really risky. Or you can take God at His word. He said, give... And it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. I said, you know what? If I help my brother with this, it isn't going to hurt me. It's going to help me. Hello now. Because God says, if I'll be a giver, that he'll just turn it around and let the blessing flow right back to me. You hear what I'm telling you? So, And you say, well, but bless God, that's your brother. That's not your family. Well, let me tell you, I paid my tithe. With the tithe on the money God sent me that I had no idea was coming, I was able to get the church caught up on its rent. I was able to get our, our storage caught up. 
Then I proceeded to buy the church a digital voice recorder so we can start recording our services uh, on a on a wave file so people can put it into their little iPods and stuff. I was able to get the church. Um, we're looking at getting the church a new video camera. I was able to order some signs so we can uh, put them up out of the, the Garland space. Uh, we were able to do a whole, I can't even remember what all we did. I'd have to look at my spreadsheet, you know, to know what all we did. But we did a lot of stuff. And you know what? Nowhere does this preacher keep a tally. Well, let me see, bless God. I'm doing this for the church, and I'm doing that for the church, and all this is for the church, and, and I'm going to keep a record. How No, no, no. Because I take God at his word. I believe what Jesus says. If you give, he said, it's going to come back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. So the best investment you can make is in other people. Amen. Whoever those other people may be. You know, one of the things that I find sad, I don't know why I'm going in this direction today, but I, I guess it's just what I feel on my heart. I find it sad sometimes when people can talk about helping folks. Well, bless God, this family was going through a hard time and, and they had no income and they had no resources. And, and bless God, I felt led to help them, so they helped them. But Josh, tell me if I'm not right in this. Something that annoys me real bad is when people can talk about helping folks that they don't know or people they're not related to, but their own family can suffer and they don't lift a finger. Am I telling the truth? See, I don't know about you, but I've been there. I've been in that position. I've sat and listened to people in my own family talk about how they help somebody else that they're not related to. There was a time when I didn't have a vehicle, I didn't have a car, and I had to hear my aunt brag about how she gave this car she had to some lady that she didn't know, some, you know, some woman off in the church somewhere or something. And I sat there and I thought to myself, I could have used a car. <laughs> That would have been a huge blessing to me. I'm trying to pastor a church. I'm trying to do the work of God. I could have used, even though it's a, you know, a used car and an older car, I, it still would have been a huge blessing to me as well. But you see, sometimes we overlook our own family as we're trying to reach out and score brownie points with God. Hello now, elsewhere. But the Lord just spoke to my heart and I felt when I saw what I had available to me, I said, well, praise God, I can help my brother. And I and you see what we don't understand. And this is something and I'm going to say this for people that are watching on the Internet. Let me fill you in on a little secret, my friend. Much of what scripture teaches us in the way that we ought to conduct ourselves with other people. With our neighbor. Much of what we read, that applies, listen to me, that applies to how you should conduct yourself with your own family as well. Amen. See, a lot of folks don't realize this. A lot of people think that family falls into a different category and neighbor is everybody outside of my family. That's why the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself, you know. So what they do is they treat the neighbor like they're wonderful and they're gold. And they treat their family like trash. Hello now. But if we would learn to apply these principles, not only to those outside of our household and those outside of our family, we might find that we have much better and much healthier relationships even within our own homes. Because I've got news for you. That child that you tuck in bed at night, before they're your child, listen to me now, this is important. Before they're your child, they are your neighbor. Hello now. Before they're your child, they are your fellow believer. Before they're your child, they are your fellow, listen, child of God. 
And if we'd learn to treat folks that way, if we'd learn to treat our family, you know what? I need to treat my kid understanding that before anything, he is also a child of God. He is also somebody struggling and striving to live for the Lord. If we had more parents who understood this and lived like this, we wouldn't have people putting their kids out on the street and abandoning them all because the child found the courage to tell mommy and daddy that they're gay. Hello now. You see, it's so funny to me that your child can be a drug addict and you'll stand by them through thick or thin. You'll put them through 14 different programs to try to get them help. Your child can be an alcoholic and you'll stick with them and you'll pray for them and you'll stand by them. But God forbid that kid comes home and says they're gay. Because then we're going to put them out on the street and we don't care if they live or die. We don't care whether they eat or not. Have you forgotten, parent, that that kid belongs to Jesus? Have you forgotten, parent, that that child is still a child of God? Have you forgotten, parent, that that child is still your neighbor? And you have an obligation to love them as you would love your own self. These men in the story we read today carried a man to the place where Jesus was. And they tore the roof off the house so they could lower him down. I tell you, God, give me a church full of people who will do whatever it takes to get those that need you where they can find you. Hello now. God, give me a church full of people. Who will do whatever it takes to get that one who's paralyzed by fear, who's paralyzed by hurt, who's paralyzed by bad experience. God, give me a church full of people who will pick that one up on their shoulder and carry them to the house of God where they can find the help they need. Amen. Lord, help us. To see those around us who can't find their own way to you. And give us the strength. And give us the faith. And give us the courage to lift them up on our shoulder and carry them to the house of God where they can be helped. Where they can receive hope. Where they can receive healing. Help us God to be an instrument of your grace in other people's lives. Amen. And that's your prayer today. And I want to tell you something. Listen to me now. And I'm going to close with this thought. Many people don't understand this. But there is a consistent theme in Scripture. Consistent theme. Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. When God heals, He forgives. Healing and forgiveness are synonymous. They work together. That's why Jesus looked at the man on this couch, this bed, and he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And everybody around him began to have a fit. Well, who's he to forgive sins? Well, honey, if you knew who he was, you'd understand why he's able to forgive sins. But he looked at him and said, Which is easier? Is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or you're healed? Which one? One, six, the other's half a dozen for me. You see, people don't understand today that God's forgiveness is married to His power. When God reaches out and touches somebody's life, forgiveness comes with that. They come as a package. It doesn't come separate comes as a package. That's why in the book of James, the Word of God said, Is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church, and let them anoint him with oil, laying hands on him, praying over him in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. But what's the very next line? And if he have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Aha! 
Aha. You know why I go into hospitals and I anoint sick folks that ask for me to come with all and pray for God to heal them? Because forgiveness is married to healing. I become not only a minister of God's healing power, I become a minister of God's forgiving power. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Now, I'm not going to go into today the difference between remission of sins and forgiveness of sins because they are two different things. And many Christian people in the world, the Christian world today, don't understand that remittance of sins and forgiveness of sins are very different things. Very different things. It's the difference between forgiving a debt and paying a debt. You can pay the debt and that person can never come after you for it again because it's been paid. Or you can forgive a debt, but then if that person breaks the terms that you've set forth, you hear me now, then you can then still pursue them for it. You can still go after them for it. And if you read in Scripture the, the parable... Of the man that came in before the king and he owed him a great deal of money. And the king said, I want my money. And the man says, oh, I haven't got any. I'm sorry, I'm broke. I don't have any. I can't repay you. And the Bible said the king forgave the debt. But then the man went out and he found someone who owed him some money. You remember the story in scripture. He found someone who owed him much less than he owed the king. And he said, I want my money. And the man said, I don't have any money. I'm so sorry. And the gentleman who was owed money said, well, you're going to debtor's prison then. I'm going to throw you in jail until your family comes up with the money to pay the debt that you owe me. What happened in that parable? Word got back to the king what this man had done. And what did the king do? He called in that debt again. You know why? Because forgiveness can be withdrawn. You hearing me? See, there are a lot of Christian people. There are a lot of Christian, there are a lot of doctrines in Christian churches. Oh, you just go to the altar and ask God to forgive your sins and you're saved. Wrong. Wrong. That's not right. Doesn't the Bible say that if we forgive men their, their trespasses, that God will forgive us? But if we don't forgive, hello now, then God won't forgive. Isn't that what the scripture says? So forgiveness is what? Conditional. Remittance is not. When a debt has been remitted, what does that mean? That means it's been paid in full. There's no more debt. So you can't call me back. Now, Josh is in the collections uh, uh, industry. He knows what I'm talking about. Once the debt has been paid, there's nothing to collect on. Am I right? But if you turn around and you don't pay that debt, but you say, well, you know what? As, as long as you're trying as hard as you are, somebody, we'll go ahead and, and we'll, we'll set this aside and don't worry about paying it. But if they don't meet the conditions, that debt can be called in. And you wind up having to stand accountable for it after all. And this is what many people in the Christian world today don't understand. That's why we're a Jesus name church. That's why we believe in baptism in Jesus name. For, according to the Apostle Peter in Acts 2.38, for what purpose? For the remission of sins. There's a difference. You see, baptism in Jesus' name is an act of obedience that brings about payment in full. Yes, can I pray and ask God to forgive my sins? Yes, you can. Will he forgive my sins? Yes, he will, on condition. Well, what condition? You've got to forgive everybody. Huh? Now, Josh, do you want to face the Lord in judgment and hope that you've forgiven everybody <laughs> in your life that's ever wronged you and done you dirty? Do you want to take that chance? Do you follow what I'm saying? But that's what a lot of people are doing. They're gambling. Because they think that forgiveness and remission are synonymous, and they are not. 
Anyway, I just I threw that out there for free. I wasn't planning on doing that today, but I threw that out there for free. The fact of the matter is this today, and I'm closing right now. The fact of the matter is this today. There are so many that need God today. There are so many that need the house of God. They need to be where Jesus is. Amen. And Jesus is here. Amen. Every time we come into this place, the Bible said that where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. People need to be here. And there are many that need to be here who may even want to be here, but they don't have the ability to make their own way. Honey, if we have the ability, then let's do everything in our power to get them here. Because not only can they find healing for their body, not only can they find deliverance from uh, obsession and deliverance from addiction, but they can also find God's forgiveness. Amen. And they can also get in touch with God's grace. And we need today to be mindful. Lord, help us to be sensitive to those around us. Somebody that needs you so desperately but can't find their own way, let me see them and, and understand their situation. And then let me go out of my way to help them get where they need to be. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Thank God for another year, 2010. Let's just pray that 2010, it's my, my 2010 has started out on a far different note than the last several years have. And I'm so grateful for that. Amen. But let's just pray that for this church and for this ministry and for all of us uh, that are a part of this church, that 2010 will be the beginning of something wonderful. Amen. Praise God and amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this simple word of encouragement and exhortation. We pray, God, that... Uh, the words which I have spoken, as simple as they may be, Lord, we just ask that you would help them to find their way into the deepest part of our heart. Help us, Lord, to meditate upon them. Lord, to uh, walk in them, not merely hear them, but do them. For you've asked us, Lord, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us to employ these principles, Lord. Help us to look for those around us who are in such a place in their lives that they're they're not able to seek you out. They're not able to find their way to that place where you are and help us, Lord, to act on their behalf in faith. Lord, help us to reach out and to lift them up and carry them, if necessary, to this place where you're able to heal, where you're able to deliver, where you're able to save to the uttermost that which is lost. Master, in the name of Jesus, once again I ask, help us, God, to be a soul-winning church. Help us to be effective in the work that you've called us to do. For, Lord, we do not want to spend years uh, merely acting out and uh, playing the part, but we want to be effective in reaching people and helping people to find the house of God and to find a relationship with you and to find your grace for their lives. Lord, we want to see the demoniac delivered. We want to see the sick healed. We want to see uh, those that are on the very verge of death raised from their bed and brought back to wellness. We want to see those, God, who are lost today in unbelief, uh, with a lack of faith in their lives. We want to see them saved and full of the Holy Ghost, serving you with great fervor, God, today. Master, help us to be a praying people. Give us a burden to pray. When we're in our cars by ourselves, Lord, let us take that time alone uh, and make it into a time of prayer and meditation. Master, help us to be in constant, open communication with you. Let our hearts cry out to you from the deepest part of our being day after day. Lord, send revival. Help us, God, to reach out to the GLBT communities as well as those who are not GLBT, but those who need restoration and those who need reconciliation. Oh, God, this hour, hear the cry of our heart and know, dear Jesus, the thoughts that possess this our minds help to know God this hour that we sincerely desire a great move of God in these last days. For the time is short and the workers are few. Grant it, we pray.
For we ask it in none other than Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Praise God.